Hey, Cool Springs family. Uh, it's good to be with you here on this video. This is, uh, well, there's a couple things I wanted to mention out of the gate here as we get started. Um, the first is I want to talk about uh, our reentry, and then we're going to get into a new sermon series. Uh, but you should have received an email already, if you're on the church's email list, uh, that we are going to be resuming our in-person gathered worship uh, on Sunday, June 7th. So if you're watching this on Sunday, March 31st, it's a week from today. And I just wanted to say a couple of things about that. Um, the first is that we recognize that God has given us to each other. He's given the body of Christ to one another. And it's a great gift that he has given us that we wouldn't walk through life alone. And when he talks about the church, he talks about the body of Christ as being, a, as being one thing, uh, as being his body, his bride. In John 17, when he prays for the church, he prays that we would be one just as he and the Father are one. Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the church being one body made up of many parts and we need each other. And so being separated for this 13 Sundays, I think it has been now, has felt very unnatural. It's felt lonely. I know that many of us, many of you have struggled uh, during this time uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, and I have sorely missed being with you. We have all sorely missed being with each other. And so on June 7th, we're going to be resuming our services uh, at all three locations. Cool Springs is going to start at 9.30, our regular meeting time. And uh, I just I wanted you to know that, that our, our leadership here at the church um, has been preparing for resuming services for weeks uh, now. And we're, in doing this, we're sensitive to the fact that the how and the when and a lot of things, frankly, about COVID-19 have become politicized uh, in a lot of circles. And I wanted to just assure you that our decision-making process has not been informed by politics. It's, we're, we're taking our information from sources like the CDC and health professionals, public servants, and our first priority in this is to support the spiritual and the relational and the physical flourishing of Christ's people. That's what we're after. And so with these gathered services, we are going to implement some precautionary practices that are going to ensure the safest possible environment that we can make. Uh, we're going to use a temporary reservation system. You're going to, if you don't already have an email about this in your inbox, uh, it should be there today or tomorrow anyway. We're going to have a reservation system. We're going to have social distancing in the room. We're going to add tracking and tracing measures. Uh, children's ministry is going to be suspended in the short term as we get going. So, so there are a lot of things that are going to be in play. And we're going to send out an FAQ. You might have already received this. I'm recording this on a Thursday. You're watching this on a Sunday. And so we might have sent it out already. Um, but there's going to be an FAQ about all of the logistics. There's been a huge team of people that have been working on all of this. Our own Melanie Rayner has been a part of a tracking and tracing course through Johns Hopkins University. Um, she and I have been working diligently to create as hospitable and safe an environment as possible. And we want to just let you know that out of the gate. We recognize that resuming worship on June 7th means that some of you um, will not be uh, able uh, or ready to resume worship for a variety of reasons that we honor uh, and that we respect. And, um, and yet, as we're, as we're looking at the data and looking at where we are, we believe that it's, it's time for us to do this in a, um, in, a, in a measured way. And so I'm excited for that. Um, be praying for that. Uh, be praying for churches. Uh, around the country and around the world who are working through this decision. We know that our church uh, is not the only church that is resuming on this day. We've consulted, we've been consulting with other uh, churches, many other churches in the city about timelines and processes and, and all of these things. And I feel really good about the measures that we have at Cool Springs uh, specifically uh, that are going to minimize points of contact, that are going to um, consider 
all the things uh, that we need to be considering. So anyway, I just wanted to say a few words about that. There, there will be an email going out. Uh, well, uh, not an email. There, you'll be able to start reserving a space for June 7th worship starting on June 1st, so starting today. Uh, there's an email that's gonna come out and it's gonna have clear instructions for how to do that. We're reserving spots because we wanna be able to manage the number of people in the room so that we can create the right kind of social distancing. So that's what that's about. Um, and so anyway, I just wanted to say that to you. Uh, we step forward trusting that the Lord will lead us and, and being sensitive to the information that we're getting uh, about the reality on the ground for us right now in this city. And we're taking it all very, very seriously. And uh, we look forward to resuming. So uh, be in prayer for that and um, know that that's coming next week. Today, we are beginning a new sermon series. And this series really piggybacks off of uh, what we talked about last week in the final sermon in the Consolation of Christ series, where we talked about what Jesus says about worship. This series is focused on the Psalms of Ascent. That is a series of 15 Psalms in the book of Psalms, Psalm 120 through 134, uh, which were a collection of songs that pilgrims would use on their way up to Jerusalem to worship. And so we're going to be working through these. And really the focus of these is on instructing the heart for worship. And so I'm excited for us to get into that. I'm going to read the passage and then we'll just dive right in. Psalm 120. In my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. Deliver me, O Lord, from lying lips, from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given to you, and what more shall be done to you, you deceitful tongue? A warrior's sharp arrows with glowing coals of a broom tree. Woe to me that I sojourn in Meshech, and that I dwell among the tents of Kedar. Too long have I had my dwelling among those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, several years ago, a friend of mine and I had this idea that we were going to summit one of Colorado's 14ers. A 14er is a mountain that is 14,000 feet or higher. Uh, there are about 53 of them in Colorado. I had never climbed a 14er before, uh, but we were going to do it. We were gonna summit um, a famous one near Estes Park called Long's Peak. And my friend had done some research on this, and he said it's not a technical climb, which means we didn't need crampons and ice axes and ropes. We could just walk up. Um, but neither of us had any real high-altitude experience, and so we didn't really know what we were getting ourselves into other than what we read. What we did know is that it was going to be amazing, that we were going to get above tree line, uh, that we'd be out in the wild. And so we started our climb as people do when they summit Long's Peak. We started our climb at about three in the morning. And we left our base camp at about 9,000 feet, winding our way through the pine and the aspen forest. And then we finally broke above tree line and we're following this rocky ledge and we look behind us, we're walking by the light of the moon and headlamps. And as we get higher and higher, we see this little snake of headlamps behind us all making their way up the same trail we've been on. And, and it was just adrenaline that got us up there. Um, the thrill of adventure, the vast wilderness, the beauty of the mountains, that's what got us up and out of our tent at three in the morning. But the higher we got, something happened that we'd read about, but we really didn't, we weren't prepared for. And that was the lack of oxygen. When you get higher and higher, the air becomes really thin and it's hard to breathe. And when it's hard to breathe, it's hard to move. It's hard to stay motivated to move. And so the higher we got, the slower we went. It was like our feet were set in blocks of concrete. And I remember at one point looking, as I'm gasping for air, looking at the summit, and it was so far away. And thinking, 
there's no way, there is no way I can do this. You ever feel that way? You have this path that you know you have to walk. But when you take stock of what it's going to require of you, when you look at the summit of it, you just wonder how you're going to manage. Kind of in that right now, right? I think this is a good metaphor for the Christian life. The Christian life is, is a climb. It's one of constant growth. It's one of constant trusting God for things that we can't see. And when we reach difficult parts of the journey, those, those parts that make the summit seem forever away, what do we do? What do we do in those moments when we feel like, I, I'm not the kind of person who can do this? I'll tell you what my friend and I did. Because if, if he and I just stood there looking at the summit in our exhaustion, we both would have concluded we can't make it. Not as weary as we were with the summit so far away. We would have just turned back. And so here's what my friend proposed. He said, let's, let's not worry about the summit. Instead, let's replace the goal of the summit with small but manageable objectives. You see that rock up on the trail about 50 yards ahead of us? Let's go to it. And then when we got to that rock, you see that bend in the trail, that little switchback over there? Let's, let's go to that switchback and then we'll take a minute and rest. Because the thing was, we could make it to the rock 50 yards in front of us. And that was something that we could repeat. We could make it to the bend and the trail and we reached the summit this way. Not by climbing a mountain, but by focusing on a series of observable, small, but still doable objectives. And in the process of figuring that out, we weren't just pilgrims on a journey that day. We were also disciples of the journey that day. In other words, we were people who didn't want to just make the journey, but we had to learn how to make the journey. We were pilgrim disciples. And that's what Christians are. We're pilgrim disciples. We're people who are on a journey and we are learning from the one who leads. Christians are never just one or the other. We're never just pilgrims or disciples. We're both. We're not pilgrims meandering with no one to follow. We're not just disciples who are studying a subject academically. We're both. We're pilgrims who are following our Lord and our master in his counsel and in his way. And so today, as we begin this series of songs of ascent, here's what they were. They, they were songs that were traditionally sung by pilgrim disciples who were making their way to worship in Jerusalem. And these psalms instructed the heart in how to come to God. Jerusalem sits geographically at a high point in Israel, so to go to Jerusalem was to go up to Jerusalem. That's the ascent, right? And this Geography was very symbolic, right? Is that life is a climb. And I appreciate the artistry of God here, that sometimes life is so hard. And God gives us a collection of songs to sing as we put one foot in front of the other to meditate on. And he's telling us with these psalms, I know life is hard. Here are some words to set your hearts on as you go. Here are some rocks that you can walk to and find some rest before you move on. These psalms are help for the weary. They are instruction for the heart. They're crumbs on the trail. And so we're going to look at the first one here today. Psalm 120. I just read it. What's going on in this psalm? This is not the kind of psalm that you read and it feels like a warm blanket and a hot mug of tea on a rainy day. This psalm is, in a word, harsh. It's a harsh psalm. In it, people are at each other's throats. This psalm opens with distress and it ends with war. And what it's doing is it's describing the reality of the pilgrim disciples' point of departure. 
For what purpose? It's describing the reality of what his situation is like. Why? What sort of a song is this? Well, it is a leaving song. The psalmist is crying out, this is where I am. And it's terrible. And I can't stay here. As a psalm of ascent, we know that these songs were sung with an eye toward the goal, worship on God's holy hill. And yet this psalm doesn't mention the summit. It doesn't even really mention the journey. It just mentions the reality of where he is starting from. What it mentions is what we're going to focus on today. It talks about what is being left behind in this journey. The psalmist writes this leaving song as somebody who is drowning. And this psalm is the gulping of air as he breaks the surface. It's the song of somebody who has been stirred deep inside to get out. For as long as people have been writing songs, we have been writing leaving songs. There have been some great ones. Slip Sliding Away from Paul Simon, Dancing in the Dark from Bruce Springsteen. Time to move on, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. One of my favorites is from Lyle Lovett. It has a fantastic title. The title is, She's Already Made Up Her Mind. And it's an absolutely haunting song. It's on Joshua Judge's Ruth, if you want to check it out. And I think you should. Um, but it's a song about a man who is with the woman he loves, and he knows that she has already decided that she's leaving him. And he sings these lines. He says, there's nothing unwavering as a woman when she's already made up her mind. So now she's sitting at one end of the kitchen table and she's staring without an expression. And she's talking to me without moving her eyes because she's already made up her mind. Ugh. She is, as the Eagles put it, already gone. Leaving songs lament. They lament the loss of something good while upholding the inevitability of change. There's nothing unwavering as a woman when she's already made up her mind. What is the lament in today's psalm? In a word, it's dissatisfaction. This psalmist is dissatisfied. He's dissatisfied with his world. He's dissatisfied with himself. And dissatisfaction with the world is not always a bad thing. In fact, it's often essential preparation for the pilgrim to go. There has to be something spurring them on to leave from where they are. There needs to be something that stirs us to get up and to seek a better way. And in this song we see heavy things articulated. Things like contempt and disgust and agitation. And we live in a culture that says those are bad things. But they're not always bad things. These all have value. Contempt, agitation, disgust. They have value when there are things worthy of such a response. Politicians run on this very idea, right? Vote for me and I'm going to change the things in the world that you find contemptible. Crime, injustice, corruption, old patterns that don't work any, anymore. And so the question that I want to ask as we're, as we're digging into this, as we're wading in, is what do you find contemptible in this world? What disgusts you? What agitates you? Does anything this one's tricky because we live in a time when people get so easily offended over just about everything, and it can be just downright exhausting. And yet, it is no virtue to be completely unoffendable, right? There should be things in this world that upset us. And this psalm is a call to dissatisfaction. It's a poke in the chest to get moving. Don't sink in the mire of what should be causing you a holy contempt. What are those pokes in the chest that is driving the pilgrim to Jerusalem? Verses 1 through 4, the first poke in the chest is, I live in a culture of lies. 
And in verses 5 through 7, the second poke in the chest is, I live in a culture of war. I live in a culture of lies and I live in a culture of war. Let's look at that first poke in the chest. Living in a culture of lies. This hasn't changed, has it? Lies and deceit are everywhere you look. Up is down, out is in, right is wrong, fact is fiction. The message of the lies of our culture comes down to one key proposition and that proposition is this this is the lie that our culture is telling us you can have a full meaningful happy life apart from God and we're told this lie all all the time you can have a full meaningful happy life apart from God and we're told this lie a thousand times in a thousand ways and the psalmist is saying that's not true how is the lie told where we're born told that we're free we're told that we're born free we're told that everything's okay we're told that if we find ourselves in pain it must be somebody else's fault and our job is to cut ourselves loose from them the true happiness is found in autonomy not dependence what is the prayer that rises up when these lies are pressing in that are saying, your life is a blank slate. It means nothing until you assign meaning to it. Now get to work. The cry of the pilgrim's heart in verse 2 is this. Dear God, deliver me. Deliver me from lies. Because they lead me to misery. They lead to my own misery. They lead to a life in a land of war. Eugene Peterson, in his wonderful book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, By the way, if you don't have Eugene Peterson's book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction, I encourage you to get it. Uh, You can check it out from a library if they're open. And you can also get them on Amazon. You can put it on Kindle, whatever. But it is his study of the Psalms of Ascent. So that's what that title is a reference to. The Long Obedience in the Same Direction is the uh, heading to Jerusalem to worship. And each chapter is one of these Psalms. But here's one of the things he says about this, about this deliver me. What he's saying is rescue me from the person who tells me of life and omits Christ, who is wise in the ways of the world and ignores the movement of the spirit. The lies are impeccably factual. They contain no errors. There are no distortions of falsified data, but they are lies all the same because they claim to tell us who we are and omit everything about our origin and destiny in God. They talk about the world without telling us that God made it. They tell us about our bodies without telling us they are temples of the Holy Spirit. They instruct us in love without telling us about the God who loves us and gave himself for us. End quote. People who are called to worship in spirit and in truth, which we talked about last week, are people who should desire deep in our spirits to be delivered from living in a culture of lies. People who worship in spirit and in truth should desire in our spirit to be delivered from lies. So that's the first poke in the chest. You live in a culture of lies. Deliver me. The second poke in the chest is you live in a culture of war. We live in a culture of hostility. And that's a product of living in a culture of lies. Right? This culture of lies breeds war and hostility. When we believe the lie that we can have a meaningful life apart from God, we can't help but fall into a life of comparison and competition with others. If I'm told life should be fine and the world should be a kind, hospitable place and then I discover that it isn't, what do I do? I want to try to fix what's broken. But if I only fix on, focus on fixing the brokenness outside of myself and not inside myself, I'm going to develop hostility toward my neighbor because they are the problem. That's what verses 5 through 7 are talking about. The lies of the pilgrim disciples' culture breed war and hostility and division. Neighbors are deeply divided. Boy, is that reality in play right now. We see it, yes, in the ways that people are responding to the pandemic and aligning with 
sides on either side of a political continuum. We see this happening there, but boy, we, we see it racially in America right now. And it's been this way. And we live in a, in a very unique period of time where we'd be fools to think that, um, that racial oppression is, is ramped up right now. What's ramped up right now is the availability of cameras. Uh, we're able to see what has been happening thousands of times over. And what we see is something is fundamentally profoundly broken. And then when it's discussed and when it's talked about, there are lies and hostility wrapped up in it. That's where we're living. And this psalm and these psalms of ascent are saying, Lord, hide me in you. Teach me what it means to follow you. He mentions these two locations, Meshach and Kadar. These are warring tribes. And the psalmist is saying, I'm camped between them. And when I plead for peace, they both just go to war. And I want out. I've been where peace is hated for too long. And so the pilgrim disciples leaving song is this, deliver me. Deliver me from a culture of lies and hostility because it erases God from the picture and it turns me against my neighbor. And that is what he has contempt for. That is what has him agitated. That is what has him upset and ready to move. So what do we do with this? What do we do with this psalm? I believe that this psalm, this leaving song, is primarily a call to repent. Let me explain. There is great power in naming the evils that befall us, in admitting that our insecurities come from lies that our culture tells us, in confessing that our self-loathing and hostility toward others come from lies that our culture has told us about success and beauty and legacy, etc. This psalm beckons us to look at where we are and to take stock of the lying voices around them and to call them what they are. And this is an important thing for us to do. It's important for us to do. But before we leave this rock and we move on to the next, we have more to own here. What is it that we have to own? Well, we have to own our own duplicity and our own hostility. And we have to repent of our own duplicity and our own hostility, our culpability in feeding and spreading the lies and the hostility. Any journey to God is not just going to be a pilgrimage away from a lying and hostile world. But it's going to be a pilgrimage away from the lying and the hostility in us, in ourselves. This psalm tells us that if we're going to live a life of obedience to our God, we must come awake to our world and to ourselves. And the word that Christians use for this is repentance. It's seeing and turning from what alienates us from God. You may think that you are not a product of your culture. We are all a product of our culture. To some degree, we can't help it. We're steeping in it. Like a tea bag in hot water. We live very comfortably in this world, which happens to be a world that denies our need to have the profound brokenness in us put right by the one who made us. And so... As you're thinking through what creates a restlessness in you to flee to God, this week I want to encourage you, name the lies that you believe that set your heart at war with others. What are the things that you believe that, that have you at war with others in your own heart, at war with yourself, at war with God? What are the lies that you tell to paint yourself in a better light? And make this psalm your leaving song. Deliver me from these things that are so twisted and so broken in the world outside, but also in the world within me. Deliver me from this. Because when we live according to the lies of our culture, we're not only taken in by them, but we also advance them. 
We advance them by treating them as truth. And so may we never be at ease in a world that tells us to ignore our creator. I close with this. The idea of the pilgrim disciples journey didn't end when the temple of the Lord moved from Jerusalem to the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in the hearts of the people of God. Jesus' best friend and disciple Simon Peter told the early church after the Holy Spirit was given. And so he's telling us by extension because this is God's word to the church that this journey continues. And he says it this way, it's 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12. He says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and as exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. You see the pilgrim disciple? Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. The goal here isn't simply to flee from the lies and the hostility of our culture. The goal is to flee to God. It's to flee to God. And in so doing, to bear witness to his grace in a world of hostility and deception. This is the journey of a pilgrim disciple to come home and to welcome others to follow. Let's go to that rock 50 yards ahead, catch our breath, and then we'll go to the bend in the trail. And then we'll repeat and repeat and repeat until we are at last home and the Lord brings us home. May God stir us to leave behind our duplicity and our hostility in such a way that we are transformed and in such a way that he is glorified. Amen. Pray with me. Father, I thank you for the uh, for, the, for the, the, the metaphor of the ascent to Jerusalem, the, the path up to worship, the symbolism that we are lowly and that you are exalted, and yet we come into your presence. Father, help us to deal honestly with our own hearts, with, with the duplicity within us, the lies we tell to paint ourselves in a better light, the ways that we compete with others in our hearts. Uh, Father, help us to understand what it means to have holy contempt, holy agitation, holy dissatisfaction, holy disgust with things that are an affront to you. And in the process of that, Lord, that it would be refining the sharpness and the depth of our love for you and for others. Give us great humility in that process that we would not just turn people into enemies who disagree with us, which is so easy to do. Lord, we thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. Lead your church forward. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, before we have our benediction and doxology, just a quick reminder, if this is your church home, Christ Pres Cool Springs, one, thank you for your continued generosity in giving to the church during this time. If uh, you are looking for a way to give, you can click on the Give button on our live stream page, christpres.org slash live. There's a button there that says Give, and that will walk you through the process of how to give a one-time gift or how to sign up for... Um, an online, regular online giving. So I uh, wanted to mention that. And we look forward to gathering uh, in person next week. We will be having, I forgot to mention this earlier, we will be doing live streams of those services as well so that whether you can attend in person or not, you can participate uh, in those services. And so we look forward to that. <clears throat> Hear the Lord's benediction as we wrap up this service. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace in the matchless name and the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing the doxology together. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. 
Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Have a great Sunday, cool springs. See you soon.